Good evening. It's always a, always a pleasure to uh, get an opportunity to uh, speak uh, at, the, at this congregation, or any congregation, uh, really. I, uh, I enjoy talking, most of you know that, so uh, it's, a, it's a nice opportunity. It's also a, a good excuse to uh, make myself study a little bit more uh, and, and share some thoughts. First of all, I hope all the fathers out there have had a happy Father's Day. Um, and I also want to uh, say that I appreciate uh, Steve Allen's comments on sanctuary. Uh, after all, we are supposed to sing songs to teach and admonish one another, and I think he did that. So, um, I also want to give you a heads up that uh, I'm not uh, I'm not feeling 100% right now. I had a, a photo shoot yesterday outdoors, and uh, I got a bit dehydrated. And instead of staying inside for the rest of the afternoon yesterday, I continued to work outside and got more dehydrated. So. Uh, I'm recovering from that a little bit, but I'll uh, probably drink a lot of water to stay upright through this, uh, through this lesson. Um, what I'd like to talk about this evening for a few minutes is who owns your soul? Uh, I, I talked to Maria about this before the lesson because she studied French at uh, uh, Friends University for two semesters. So. Uh, she's my uh, go-to person on uh, French pronunciations because they, they never look like they sound. They do that on purpose, I think. Uh, Urbain Grandier is the way she should pronounce. She says I should pronounce it, but I'm not going to most of the time. Grandier. I'm not going to do that. But Urbain Grandier lived from about 1590 to 1634. He was a Catholic uh, priest who reportedly didn't honor his vow of celibacy very well. Uh, in 1632, uh, a group of nuns accused him of bewitching them, uh, seducing them, uh, sending demons to have improper relations with them, and, and, uh, and various other things. Uh, a, a lot of what went on centered around witchcraft. Uh, I think that's a good excuse for saying, uh, I did something I knew I shouldn't do and I want to blame it on someone else, so I'm going to say he you know, vexed me or, or had demons come and, and visit me and, and do things that I knew I shouldn't do, but I was not under my own control at that point. Um, legend has it, has it that the, uh, uh, the mother superior of the local uh, convent, the uh, Ursuline convent, Sister uh, Jeannet of Angels, was obsessed with him, but uh, he didn't feel the same about her. And so when he uh, rejected her, he uh, uh, found himself uh, accused by uh, the mother superior and other various nuns at the convent uh, as uh, uh, the accusations came out, more and more nuns came forward uh, making accusations of him. But as uh, these, the trials went on, he was uh, acquitted by an ecclesiastical tribunal. Uh, I don't know exactly what an ecclesiastical tribunal is, but he was acquitted by one. Uh, now, I don't know about you, if I was accused of some wrongdoing and I got off, I would probably try to lie low a little bit. But Urbain Grandier did not do such. He, uh, he's, he remained being a pretty high profile character. Uh, he used his position in the church to uh, um, criticize Cardinal Richelieu, which many of you may recognize uh, the name. He was chief minister under King Louis XIII. A lot of people say that really uh, during the latter part of King Louis's reign over France, Cardinal Richelieu was really the guy in charge running things while King Louis was doing whatever he felt like doing. Urbain uh, Grandier was critical of Cardinal Richelieu, both verbally and, and he published papers, had written documents where he criticized uh, the Cardinal. And obviously, you go threatening someone who essentially has the power of the king, and you may find yourself in a little bit of trouble. And he did. Uh, Richelieu ordered a second trial of Urbain Grandier within two years of the original trial. Interestingly enough, the nuns who had uh, accused uh, Grandier of the wrongdoing did not stand behind their original uh, accusations. Um, so Richelieu found himself in an odd position. He's trying to convict this guy. He's trying to shut him up. He's trying to get him out of the way. And, uh, and these uh, nuns who had once accused him no longer are accusing him. So. During the course of the trial, they started to uh, torture him, uh, to try to get him to say what they wanted him to say. Uh, they uh, produced uh, some documents. 
I didn't turn the wireless on it. I'm going to walk around, so I'm going to need it. I'm just giving you a warning, Kenny. Uh, they produced some documents that supposedly were signed by Urbain Grandier. This is one of them right here. We don't know if that's a forgery or not. I'm kind of guessing he is since he never actually admitted any wrongdoing. Uh, it's all in Latin. A lot of it's written backwards in Latin, so it's really hard to read. Over here, oops, wrong button. Over here we see the signatures and seals of uh, various demons, uh, including uh, Satan, uh, Lucifer, uh, Beelzebub, Leviathan, and, and so forth. I'm not going to try to read everything that's up there, but I'll give you the, uh, a paraphrased uh, version, uh, if you'll bear with me for just a, minute, for just a few moments. It says, We, the influ influential Lucifer, the young Satan, Beelzebub, Leviathan, uh, Elamy, and Astaroth, together with others, have today accepted the covenant pact of Urbain Grandier, who is ours. And him do we promise the love of women and various other things, ver the respect of monarchs, uh, honors, lusts, and, and powers. Uh, he'll commit sins of the flesh. Uh, he will defile holy things uh, for us in the church. And he will live 20 happy years uh, on the earth of men and later join us in sin against God. Bound in hell, signed in the council of the demons, Lucifer, Beelzebub, Satan, Astroth, Leviathan, and the others over here. You see their signatures. Uh, Grandier was convicted because of this document uh, and, and others like it. Uh, he was sentenced to the extraordinary question, uh, which if you're familiar with the with torture, back then they had uh, uh, various forms that they used. There was the ordinary question, which I guess is if you're only a little bit satanic or whatever, where your nose would be pinched, you'd be bound, you'd, and a gallon of water would be forced down your throat, and you have a choice. You either inhale it or drink it. You either drown or fill up your stomach. And I don't know about you, I don't think I could drink a gallon. I'm a little dehydrated right now. It sounds like a good idea. I don't think I could pull it off. Grandier was sentenced to the extraordinary question, which was two gallons of water. And somehow he still survived, so afterwards he was burned at the stake. And all that, he never confessed uh, any form of witchcraft or satanic activity or anything like that. Uh, I don't know if he was ever asked about the adultery that he was accused of, but, uh, but nonetheless, he never confessed the witchcraft. Now, I never thought selling your soul to the devil was a very complex concept. I always thought of it as, you know, it's a relative term. Uh, you know, com common day today we think of, uh, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, that's uh, a culture where, uh, you know, musicians looking to seek fame and fortune uh, essentially sell their soul. You're going to turn away from things that are good so that you can become famous. Because if you want to be a famous rock musician, you have to work your way up. You have to do things like uh, playing concerts and bars and nightclubs and hanging around with unruly people, uh, things like uh, drugs and alcohol and all kinds of things like that are associated with that kind of lifestyle. Uh, it's, it's a very common thing uh, to see in uh, that in the music industry. Um, and many of you may know I'm I'm a musician. I don't just lead singing. I also play bass. I've played uh, the double bass or the contrabass or my dad calls it the bass fiddle, string bass, whatever. I've played that since 1984. I've played bass guitar since 1989. I've been in various rock bands, but the struggle is always to stay focused on Christianity while still trying to have fun and play music and not get tied into things that you shouldn't be involved in. Um, I've got a friend uh, who we used to uh, go to school with in Oklahoma City. He's a drummer. And uh, one year, Maria bought me a set of drums for Valentine's Day, I think it was. Funny, I knew two drummers, and neither of them had a set of drums. So if a band wanted to get together and jam or whatever, uh, we, they were left uh, beating on pots and pans or practice pads or something weird like that. Um, so we bought a set of drums so the drummers could come over and, and wail on them, and we could have a good time. Uh, but one friend in particular had, had made the comment that he has felt the drummer in his soul was decaying, was dying, was rotting away. And so he was so thankful that we bought this set of drums that he'd come out and, and express himself and, and feel uh, like a musician once again because he hadn't been able to play drums in years since he was out of high school. Um, interestingly enough, when he moved back home, 
he found himself wanting to play drums again. And instead of getting wrapped up into a band that's doing the bar scene and, and all that kind of stuff, uh, he's decided to uh, worship with uh, a more liberal Christian church on Saturday nights where he performs in their band. And then on Sunday mornings, he attends with his family at the acapella church a few miles down the road. Uh, it's not always about booze and women. It's, uh, it can sometimes be about other things, just the desire to play sometimes. But I never thought that anybody could be fooled by the concept of selling your soul to Satan, that a document such as this would, would carry any weight. But uh, obviously in 1634, uh, that was not the case. Um, let's look at some scripture real quick. Hebrews 5. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. He was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Now to me, this is, this is saying that you don't necessarily have a soul that you can sell, but if you obey Jesus, who learned obedience from what he suffered and was made, made perfect, he becomes your source of eternal salvation. Your soul isn't really yours to sell. You can't necessarily earn it back, but your soul is saved. Your salvation comes from obedience. So where does this concept of selling your soul come from? Uh, the diabolical pact, as it's often called. Uh, it, uh, as far as I can tell, originated in German folklore um, back around uh, 1587 or so. Uh, there was a, a gentleman named Johann Faust who lived from 1480 to uh, 1540. He was an alchemist, an astrologer, and a magician. Now, a lot of what we read about uh, Johann Faust we can't really tell if it's truth or fiction because the tales of Faust have become so uh, uh, mixed up with the, the fiction that was written about him, it's hard to know what was really true, but uh, we're pretty certain that the, uh, the alchemist part is accurate because uh, supposedly his death was caused by a, a failed uh, chemistry experiment where he blew himself up uh, and was uh, uh, gravely uh, mutilated by the explosion. But the legend goes that he was a highly successful scholar, uh, but he was just dissatisfied with his life. He wasn't happy with the way things were going. And so uh, he petitioned the devil. He, uh, he speaks with uh, a representative of the devil, uh, Mephistopheles um, is the name given to this character. He's been written about in lots of different uh, literary, literary works since these Faust uh, legends were written. Sometimes it's changed or shortened or, you know, to various things. Uh, Mephisto is, is an easy pronunciation instead of Mephistopheles, but uh, uh, nonetheless, he makes a pact with the devil's representative to gain worldly knowledge, worldly pleasure. Um, this supposedly is going to make Faust happy. Uh, now, various legends um, of Faust, it's kind of, the story kind of took on a life of its own. It, uh, much like Sherlock Holmes, where it was started with one writer, and in this case, uh, it was really uh, an anonymous author who started publishing uh, the, the tales of Faust in uh, 1587. Um, we really don't know who the first one to write these things down uh, was. Um, it was after Faust was dead, so we don't think it was autobiographical or anything. Um, but nonetheless, they took on a, a life of their own. The stories were expanded. They grew and grew. They became very popular. Um, and the, the, the tales were everywhere. There are all kinds of variations of how things went. Um, and not always did all the stories line up. You know, we have the original Arthur, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle stories of Sherlock Holmes. And some people try to write additional stories that fall in line with the original Sherlock Holmes, where some people don't care and they just kind of use the character and make up their own story. And the same thing happened here uh, with Faust. Um, but at least one legend, and uh, probably various legends, um, that, that deal with this contract with the devil, uh, say that the contract was going to end when Faust experienced 
a zenith of happiness. He, he became the most hap the, the happiest he could ever become. That's when his life would end. Mephistopheles would come, take his life, take his soul, and he would uh, dwell in hell forever. Uh, at this point, Faust thought, aha, you know, this will never happen. I'll live forever. You know, it's, sometimes it's a little trickery trying to, to uh, you know, keep things going between him and the devil or, or whatever. Um, but uh, more often than not, the great happiness that Faust is looking for, he never attains. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty grim concept making a deal with the devil, really. But uh, in a lot of ways, it was used in a somewhat scriptural essence where if you live the life that the world thinks you should live, if you chase worldly wisdom, if you change worldly, chase worldly pleasures, you chase worldly knowledge, things don't always turn out the way you think they should. Um, I don't find any reference in the scriptures of anybody ever signing a, a paper contract with Satan, but we do see some interactions with some people who are trying to gain some things on earth, or the devil's trying to manipulate them in the scripture. Uh, in, in scripture, let's uh, look at a few pieces of these uh, for just a minute. Worldly knowledge, pleasure, and power. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the woman and the serpent, starting in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from uh, the trees, I mean, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She kind of made a deal with the devil. The devil said, take some of this, and you will be as knowledgeable as God. And she bought it. Then the eyes, um, I'm sorry, she took, uh, she took and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They did gain knowledge, as Satan promised, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves, to get, leaves together and made coverings for themselves. He was promised worldly gain by Satan's offer, and she accepted his terms. He passed it along to, to Adam as well. Uh, another, uh, another example of some interaction we see, um, this is actually uh, in the books of Kings and Chronicles. We think of King Solomon. He petitioned God for worldly wisdom and got it. And with all of the wisdom and all the knowledge that he had, as, as great of a mind as he was, the people came from all over the place and marveled at everything that he knew. He still fell into the traps of fleshly desires and fleshly things. And we know that in the end, it turned out quite badly for Solomon in the kingdom of Israel. Uh, one more example, we're going to look at Jesus in the wilderness, where Satan tries to cut a deal with Jesus three times. Matthew 4, starting in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point in the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Now, this scripture kind of gets beat to death. We'll, we'll finish it up really quick here. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. 
Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. It's a story we all know well. But just a few questions here that, that I'm thinking about as, as we're thinking about negotiating terms with the devil. The devil says, turn these stones into bread. Is that inherently sinful? Jesus was hungry. Jesus obviously had the power to do so. He had turned uh, water into wine, or was going to, uh, or did, did so for his mom. Uh, he uh, fed thousands of people, starting with just a few loaves of bread, and multiplied them into many, and, and, and fish as well. So creating food for sustenance, was there anything inherently wrong with that? He did that later on. Why was it wrong for him to do that here? The pattern I see in, in the way Jesus used his power was that when he was doing these things, he was doing them for other people. He wasn't using the power for himself to make himself feel better or to sustain himself. He used his power to be an example for us and be uh, an example for others and show his powers to others. Uh, second, they're at the highest point of the temple and Satan tells him to throw himself down. It's a great way to draw attention to yourself. He wants to come to the world and say, hey, look at me, I'm the son of God, watch this. And he jumps off the temple and the angels come and swoop him up. He'd certainly have people's attention. He'd certainly pick up some believers from that. But that's not really the way Jesus was operating when he was on earth. He wasn't working by his own rules. He was working by his father's rules. Again, he came to the world to, to, to save us, to, to show us how to serve others. And doing a big showy maneuver like jumping off the temple and not dying wasn't really what he was about. Third, the devil offered him kingdoms of the world. Isn't that what Jesus was sent here for? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, Mark 11, 17. The gospel must first be preached to all nations, Mark 13, 10. Therefore, go, into, uh, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, Luke 24, 47. If he was king of all nations, he could say, look, I'm the Son of God. I'm here to save you, do what I say. If he was the ruler of all nations, he could, you know, put down an edict, say, everybody do this, we're all in the kingdom of God, we're a nice happy family now, right? Well, back up a little bit on, on Luke chapter 24, it's uh, Luke 24, 44 through 48. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. He told them, verse 46, he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. With all his power and all his might, he still had to follow the Father's plan. Not his own. As he's praying in the garden, he didn't necessarily want to go through with the plan, but he was bound by what his father said to do, not his own choosing. In 1986, Columbia Pictures released a film uh, entitled Crossroads. Um, probably summer of 86 or summer of 87, I probably watched this movie 100 times. Now, I'm not recommending it to anybody. It's got a, a lot of things in it that are pretty worldly, some, some uh, pretty strong language and concepts and such, but but uh, I was just sucked into this movie by uh, the music. Uh, uh, Ry Cooter, a uh, famous musician, uh, orchestrated the music, uh, arranged the music for this, for this movie. Uh, just uh, some, a lot of tremendous guitar playing. And, and the plot of the story is we have Ralph, Ralph Macchio, that's him right there, the karate kid, as you may know. Uh, and he plays a, a guitar student at Juilliard named Eugene. Uh, fantastically gifted player on... Uh, playing classical music, but he also is fascinated with the blues, and his instructors at Juilliard think this is a worthless endeavor, him studying the blues, because uh, in his classical guitar teaching, that's really what the guitar is all about. All the other stuff is worthless, but nonetheless, he becomes fascinated with uh, Robert Johnson, which I'll talk about in just a minute, and listening to his music, he hears him singing about a guy named Willie Brown. And he does some research and he finds that Willie Brown is in New York City at uh, like a, an old folks home, I'll just call it, 
uh, not far from where he is. He actually gets a job as a janitor in that old folks home so he can go meet Willie Brown and talk to the great Willie Brown uh, harmonica player, played by Joe Seneca here on the left. Willie Brown was a friend of blues legend Robert Johnson. Now Robert Johnson wrote a few songs about selling his soul to the devil, or discussed it some, he even said that he joked around that he'd sold his soul to, his de sold his soul to the devil. He wasn't a, a very popular guitar player when he was on earth. He only lived to be 27 years old. This picture was only one of two known of, of Robert Johnson uh, that were ever taken. Uh, this one was taken two years before he died. Um, he wasn't famous. He didn't have a fortune. Uh, most people in the music industry had no clue who he was. But he was an extremely gifted songwriter and guitar player. Um, 1961, his recordings were released. A lot of people found him. He became very influential in the music industry. Uh, Robert Plant, uh, Blood Zeppelin, uh, Eric Clapton, uh, Brian Jones, Keith Richards, and Mick Jagger from uh, the Rolling Stones all cite Robert Johnson as a great influence on their music, uh, as well as many others. He's been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, Rolling Stone magazine calls him the fifth greatest guitar player of all time. Um, and, but when he was on this earth, he was an unknown. Uh, he, but he yet still joked about selling his soul to the devil because of some of the places he performed in, he knew that he had turned his back on God when he was performing in these bars and juke joints and such like that, and for, you know, uh, enjoying the life of a, of a musician as it were. Uh, he wrote a song, Me and the Devil, and he also wrote, cro wrote Crossroad Blues, uh, which is uh, uh, where he's commenting about uh, uh, selling his soul to the devil. Uh, and the movie all revolves around Willie Brown's effort uh, to renege on a similar contract that Willie Brown had made with the devil uh, regarding his harmonica playing abilities. But Willie Brown uh, never received fame and fortune either, and he wasn't a big famous uh, harmonica player or anything, so he feels that he's... The devil hasn't held up to his side of the contract, and he wants to uh, get out of the contract. So Eugene and Willie Brown go down to Mississippi to get Willie out of his contract. They meet up with the devil, who's nicknamed Scratch, named himself Scratch uh, in, in the movie. Uh, they meet up with Scratch, and Willie Brown says, I want out of this contract. You didn't hold up your end of the deal. And the devil, Scratch, says, hey, you know what? You're in no position to negotiate. Through the course of things, Eugene and the, uh, the devil, Scratch's guitar player uh, named Jack Butler in the movie, played by Steve Vai, uh, another uh, famous uh, guitar player, uh, they, they, they cut heads. They play head to head. They, they have a playoff in front of an audience and the winner of the competition will determine the fate of Willie Brown. Now, Willie Brown says, you know, uh, l l let my boy play against your boy. You know, we'll go head to head. And if my boy wins, I'm out. And the devil says, fine, that's great. But what if I win? Willie Brown says, well, you get me. The devil says, I already got you. And Eugene steps up and says, well, you get me too. I always thought for, for a few moments there that that's kind of odd. Because all through the story of this movie, these guys traveling across country, neither one of them are obviously living for Christ. Neither one of them are, are paying any respect to God or anything through their actions or their language or anything else. And then all of a sudden, Eugene is stepping up and saying, well, you can have my soul too. To me, the devil already had him too. But there was an interesting uh, moment there where, you know, Eugene offers himself as a sacrifice to save his friend. And that's, that's pretty, you know, touching. But, you know, we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've, we've all sinned. At some point, we're all the devil. And fortunately for us, we have a mediator. Someone who is far superior to this model that was offered up in the movie that... You know, Eugene, someone who's obviously already lost, could come and save Willie Brown or anybody. We have a much more perfect model. Uh, in Romans 3, we read, 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's Romans 3, 22 through 24. We're saved through grace. It's not the actions of a friend who's an awesome, awesome guitar player, or the actions of a friend who's a great preacher, or the actions of a friend who's great, uh, you know, with Bible studies or, or, you know, starting conversations about God. All the work that we do on earth, none of that is going to save us. It's through His grace that the redemption came by Jesus Christ. We are lost, and we cannot save ourselves. We cannot save our friends. But we can bring them to Christ so that through grace, Christ can save them. Genesis 8, uh, 21. Every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. We don't start out saved. We don't have our soul. That's not in our possession to do it as, as we will. We say, you know what, I think I'm going to be a rock star. I'm going to sell my soul to the devil. You know, we have to move to the other way and say, I'm going to give my soul to Christ. I'm going to live my life for Christ. I'm going to sacrifice myself to Christ so that we can be justified by his grace. I'm running a little bit long, but I've got one more uh, quick story that I'm gonna throw in here before I wrap this up. Uh, I've got a, uh, a friend who was a, uh, a roommate at OC. Uh, every time, you know, back up for a second. Every time he got into some financial trouble, he would sell his guitar, he would pawn his guitar. When I met him, he had a guitar. He needed money, he'd pawn it. After a few months, he said, man, I really got to play guitar. He'd go out and he'd buy another guitar. He'd have it for a while, and then he'd have to pawn it, whether he needed to pay his rent or pay some bills or fix his car or whatever. Every time I was turning around, he was buying a guitar, selling a guitar, buying a guitar, selling a guitar. One time, he went into a music store in Oklahoma City, and he bought a guitar, and he bought an amp and the cord and the, pack, the whole package. And then he decided to go out on the road and do some traveling and working, and he couldn't take his stuff with, us, with him. So he was storing it at my house. One day, he calls me up. He says, hey, I need some money. Grab my guitar, all my gear, and go, go uh, cash that in for me. Get, get some cash for me. I said, all right. He's going to be buying another one in a few weeks. He's like, yeah, I know, but I need the cash. So I told him that I took the guitar and I pawned it, and I gave him some cash so that he could pay his bills or do whatever he needed to do. And then the next time he was in town, he came over to my house, and I gave him the gift of an unpawnable guitar. It was a guitar that he couldn't pawn because it wasn't his. It was a gift that I gave to him that any time he wanted to play, any time he felt the need to play, any time he felt the need to express himself, to write his songs, or do whatever he needed to do, all he had to do was come over to my place, pick that guitar up, and he could do whatever he wanted to, but it was never his to pawn again because I owned it. I just let him use it whenever he wanted. Never left my house, always stayed in my studio or whatever. Uh, in the years since, he has uh, kind of turned his back on his friends. He, uh, he's kind of gone off and done his own thing. He uh, left his wife, uh, quit paying his bills, kind of did whatever. And that guitar still hangs in my studio years later. Just took that picture about two hours ago. Hasn't been played in a long time. I pick it up and play it a, li a little bit, but it's a six string and I'm a bass player, so I'm not very good at it. My fingers don't like the small strings so much. It's a gift for him. Anytime he wants to come by, he can play it. But for whatever reason, in his head, he's decided to burn those bridges. He doesn't call, he doesn't swing by, he just does his own thing. Romans 6, verse 22, starting in verse 22. Now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The gift of eternal life is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We're set free because we've become slaves to God. We find freedom in the slavery to God. We find freedom from the sin. We find a happier life than a lot of people out there that are doing their own thing. They think they're going to find fame and fortune and, and do all these great things. And in the end, uh, you know, a lot of guitar players, how many have we seen that have died from drug overdoses or they go through rehab and they go through rehab and they wreck their car because they're drunk driving or high or, or any number of things. They get involved in, in gang activity 
uh, and get shot down or, or whatever because they're living this happy life that they thought they wanted because they sold their soul to the devil. When the whole time there's a gift, a gift of salvation from Jesus Christ that has been left for us. And any time, all we have to do is go over the wall and pick up that gift, recognize what has been given to us, take, take advantage of that gift and use that gift of salvation from Christ our Lord. If you're here tonight and you need the gift of salvation, uh, we'd like to help you. If you've accepted the gift of salvation, but you're having struggles, you've been leaving that guitar hanging on the wall, and you, need, you know you need to come back to it, you, need, you know you need to come back to Jesus, and start doing the right things, you need to recognize his power, recognize the gift, and all you have to do is come accept it. Anything that we can do to help you at all in your walk, in your life, we'd be glad to do for you, come, if you'd come as we stand and sing.